It is wonderful to be with you this morning. And so we're going to continue our study of Acts by looking at Acts chapter 19 this morning. And we'll look at Acts 19, verses 1 through 10. And Acts chapter 19 can be found on page 1103 in your pew Bibles as well. And if you're able to, let's stand for the reading of God's word. And the Holy Spirit says through our author Luke in Acts 19. And it happened that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And let us pray now together. Our Father, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, who has given us new life through the miracle of regeneration. We who have trusted in Christ are new creations in him. We are not yet where we shall be, but we are not what we once were. You have saved us and delivered us from the dominion of sin and transferred us to the kingdom of your beloved Son. Your love for us knows no bounds. Your grace has no limit. We are righteous in your sight through the righteousness of Christ. We are wise because we know Jesus, who makes known to us your words. We desire to be like Christ, to live as he lived and walk as he walked, that we might display his love to others. Give us the power to die to sin and live for your kingdom. When we are tempted, may we remember your promises and trust in your word instead of the lies of the evil one. Deliver us from both the power and presence of sin in our lives, that we would seek after Christ and follow him in a life of love, faith, and dependence on you. Forgive us where we fall short. Have mercy on us for the sake of your name. Make a great name for yourself, O God, by rescuing us from ourselves. Root out the idols in our life so that we can worship and serve you alone. For you alone are worthy of all honor, glory, and praise. Keep us from spiritual adultery, that we would walk closely with Jesus by faith and not by sight. And with childlike trust, we commit ourselves to you, to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this we will do by your grace, always looking to your Son by faith. As we look now at the book of Acts together, open our eyes to see the beautiful truths of your word. And we pray for all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you may be seated. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist Church in the 18th century. And Wesley was used by God to reach many people for Christ. But before Wesley became a famous evangelist, he had to be converted to Christ as every other Christian is. Wesley grew up in the church. His father was in the ministry. And later in life, he became a missionary to the Native Americans living in modern-day Georgia. But Wesley's missionary efforts were a disaster, and he saw no converts during his time in America. He later encountered a group of Christians known as Moravians, and the Moravians were dedicated to worship, prayer, and Bible reading. And Wesley was struck by their zeal and their devotion to God. And at one of their meetings, he encountered Jesus Christ for the very first time. And Wesley wrote about this experience in his journal. 
Wesley said, In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone, for my, for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And now that Wesley was saved, he could become a great missionary for Christ. And there were many churches that were planted by him in America later on. You see, even religious people like John Wesley need the gospel. Just because someone goes to church or claims to believe in Jesus doesn't mean they are a born-again Christian. People need to know the real Jesus and the real gospel that is found in the Bible. And in our passage for this morning, the Apostle Paul encounters some disciples of John the Baptist. They were disciples of John, but they were not disciples of Jesus. And Paul asked them some questions, and they didn't even know about the Holy Spirit or about Jesus Christ. And so Paul tells them about Jesus for the very first time, and they are saved and baptized. And so let's begin by looking at verses 1 through 7, where we read about Paul's encounter with them. Paul here is in the city of Ephesus. Paul was in Ephesus earlier that we looked at in our sermon for last week. But he had to leave Ephesus and go to Jerusalem. But now he has come back to Ephesus, and he's going to fulfill the promise that he made, that he would return to them if the Lord wills. And so he meets these disciples of John the Baptist, and he begins to ask them some questions. John the Baptist was the man whom God chose to prepare the way for Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And John preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John preached repentance. He called people to turn away from their sins back to God. John was a prophet of God, like the Old Testament prophets of old, who called Israel to repentance as he ministered in the wilderness. And so John baptized people, and this baptism was a physical act of faith and repentance toward God. And this was meant to prepare their hearts for the coming of Jesus. And it is repentance that leads to the forgiveness of sins. And so Paul encounters them, and he asks them an interesting question. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, Paul could have asked them instead, do you believe in Jesus, or have you heard about Jesus yet? But he asked them this question instead. And I think he does this because this is a diagnostic question. He's asking them this question to see if they really believe in Jesus. Because if they have really believed in Jesus, then they will experience the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. If they are born-again believers in Jesus, they will have the Holy Spirit, and they will know the power of the Spirit in their lives, and they will have experienced some of the Spirit's gifts in their lives. And so that's a question for us today. Have we experienced the Spirit's power? Do we know the Holy Spirit? Are we truly saved? Have we experienced the gifts and the power and the abilities of the Spirit in our lives? Do we know the Holy Spirit? Not just do we know about the Holy Spirit, but do we know the Holy Spirit personally? Does the Spirit of God bear witness with our spirits that we are sons and daughters of God? And Paul asked them this question as well, because the Bible teaches that all those who are saved, all those who truly believe in Jesus for salvation, have the Holy Spirit. They receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And later on in verses 15 and 16 of Romans 8, Paul says, For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And lastly, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, 
we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So a Christian without the Holy Spirit is a contradiction in terms. If you are a Christian, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit in you, and you are a temple of the living God. And so their answer to Paul's question, that we have not even heard of the Holy Spirit, is astonishing. It is a jaw-dropping answer. How could you not know who the Holy Spirit is? Because even the Old Testament scriptures talk about the Holy Spirit. Even in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, it talks about how the, the Spirit is hovering over the waters of creation. The Holy Spirit should be known by all Christians. If we are believers in Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling our hearts. These disciples of John were in ignorance of who God is. They didn't know God the Holy Spirit. And I think there are many professing Christians today who would give a similar answer to Paul's question. They may know about the Holy Spirit, but they don't know very much about the Holy Spirit. And if they are not saved, they've never experienced the Spirit's saving power in their lives. The Holy Spirit has often been referred to as the forgotten member or person of the Trinity. Yet the Bible has a lot to say about the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is God. In Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4 that we looked at earlier, we read it that lying to the Holy Spirit is the same as lying to God. To lie to the Spirit is the same as lying to God because the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is identified by Paul as the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, Paul says to the Corinthians, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit created us. He is our creator. Job says in Job 33, verse 4, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. The Holy Spirit made us, and only God can create the Holy Spirit is identified in the Bible as God's very presence, who is everywhere. Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8 says this, Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. So the Holy Spirit is God's very presence, who is everywhere. We cannot escape the Holy Spirit, no matter where we go because the Spirit is omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is also called eternal, or having always existed, and only God is eternal. Hebrews 9.14 says this, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And so Hebrews 9.14 is a very Trinitarian verse because it speaks about the Son offering himself to the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwelled in him. And I'll give you one more verse in the Bible about this. In Matthew 28, verse 19, in the Great Commission, Jesus identifies the Holy Spirit as God, because the Holy Spirit is included in the one name of God. Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize this way baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So name here is singular because there's only one God. There's only one name of God, which is Yahweh. Yahweh is the name Lord in the Old Testament in all capital letters. Yahweh is God's one true name. Yahweh means that God is. He is the one who was, is, and is to come. So our God is Yahweh, the one who always has been. And the one God is exist as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so what does the Holy Spirit do in our lives? Well, the Holy Spirit is actively involved in the church today. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins, and he convicts the world of their sins and points them to Christ. He gives to the church spiritual gifts, and if you're a believer in Jesus, God has given to you at least one spiritual gift in your life to be used to serve others.
the Holy Spirit gives to us assurance of salvation. He, he is the one who seals us and keeps us and preserves us until we go to be with Jesus. He intercedes with us in our prayers, and he empowers us for ministry, and he can be grieved by our sins, as Paul says. The Holy Spirit is called by Jesus the advocate or the helper. He is the one who is with his church, and the Holy Spirit is sent into the world by the Father and the Son to guide the church while Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Jesus promised his disciples this. In John 14, 26, Jesus said to his disciples, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He instructs us in the ways of God as we read the word of God together. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes to understand the mysteries of God in the Bible. And the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. And the Spirit would bring to the remembrance of the disciples all that Jesus said so they could write the four Gospels that we have today. And Jesus promised his, his disciples this in John fifteen twenty six. He said to them, When the Holy Spirit, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The Holy Spirit points people to Jesus Christ. And Jesus says here that the Spirit proceeds from the Father. And so this is one way we can distinguish between the Father and the Spirit. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, which I believe is talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. And so the Spirit proceeds from the Father, and the early church fathers distinguish between the Father and the Son by saying that the Son is begotten by the Father which I believe is describing the exaltation of Jesus Christ, which is, which, is, which is talked about in Psalm chapter 2. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And so the Holy Spirit is sent from the Father through the Son to empower the church for ministry. And that is what we see on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was sent from the Father through the Son to give to the church these new spiritual gifts to equip them for ministry. And so we can only do ministry by the power of the Spirit. And so we see here in this passage the difference between Apollos, whom we talked about last Sunday, who is a man who is described as being fervent in the Spirit, and these disciples of John who don't know anything about the Holy Spirit and who have never heard about Jesus Christ. Apollos was a man who had the Holy Spirit, but these disciples do not have the Spirit yet. And so Paul asked them a second question because he too seems to be surprised by their answer. Paul, I believe, was taken aback by their response that they have not even heard about the Holy Spirit. And so he asked them a follow-up question. He asked them, into what then were you baptized? And so why does Paul ask them this question? Why does he ask them into what, you, into what then were you baptized? Well, I think he asked them this question because of the Great Commission. And so what does the Great Commission and baptism have to do with the Holy Spirit? Well, if you remember, in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus tells his disciples to baptize people into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is included in the baptismal formula that Jesus gives to his disciples. And so if these disciples of John had been baptized into the baptism of Jesus, they would have heard about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is included in the baptismal formula that Jesus gave. And so if they had been baptized with the baptism of Jesus and into his name, they would have heard about the Holy Spirit. And these disciples of John were not baptized into the baptism of Jesus and into his name, but they were instead only baptized into the baptism of John the Baptist. They did not realize that John's baptism was meant to point people to Jesus. John was sent only to be one who would testify about Jesus. John is not the object of our faith. 
The object of our faith is Jesus, not John the Baptist. John was only someone who was a, a bright and, ch- and shining lamp to point people to Jesus, who is the way of salvation. The Messiah, Jesus, has already come, but these disciples of John didn't know that. And so Paul tells them about Jesus for the very first time, and they are saved by believing in the name of Jesus Christ. Because only Jesus can cleanse people from sin, not John. John the Baptist preached about forgiveness, but only Jesus Christ can forgive people of their sins. And now that these disciples are believers in Jesus, they need to be baptized as Jesus commanded his disciples in the Great Commission. And so they are baptized into the baptism of Jesus and not just John. And this raises an important question about baptism because these disciples of John are baptized in Christian baptism even though they were already baptized into the baptism of John. And why is that? Because Apollos, in the previous chapter, he was baptized into the baptism of John, but we never read about him being rebaptized into the baptism of Jesus. And the 11 apostles of Jesus, who baptized them? They were baptized into the baptism of John. They would have been baptized by John or his disciples into that baptism, but we never read about the 11 apostles of Jesus being rebaptized into the baptism of Jesus. And so I think the reason why these disciples of John are rebaptized is because when they were baptized by John into his baptism, they were not true believers in, in Jesus then. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They were not saved. And Christian baptism is a baptism for believers alone. It is for believers in Jesus. And so baptism is for those who are believers. And since they were not saved when they were baptized, they needed to be baptized into Christian baptism, though Apollos and the apostles of Jesus did not need to be rebaptized. And then it goes on to talk about their receiving of the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. Paul lays his hands on them, and they begin to prophesy and speak in tongues. They receive the very same gifts of the Spirit that the believers did on the day of Pentecost. This is their own mini Pentecost experience. They begin to speak in tongues. And speaking in tongues is a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit that was given to believers in the first century and that empowered them to speak in a foreign language that they had not been taught before. So as I've illustrated before, if I was to start speaking in Japanese, that would be a miracle. Only God could do that. And so God, I believe, also gave them the gift of tongues to be able to communicate the gospel to those who do not speak their language. Because there are many people out in in rural communities around Ephesus who may not know Greek, which was the language of the day. And they also prophesied. And prophecy describes speaking the very words of God. A prophet is one who says, thus says the Lord. And so the words that a prophet speaks are the very words of God himself. And so there are four times in the book of Acts where speaking in tongues is mentioned. The first one is in Acts chapter 2, where we see the Jewish believers speak in tongues and prophesy. The second example is in Acts chapter 8, where the Samaritans receive these gifts of the Holy Spirit as a result of the laying on of the apostles' hands. The third example is in Acts chapter 10, where Gentile believers Receive, receive these gifts as a result of hearing the gospel. And so Cornelius and his family receive these gifts, and then they, uh, and they are baptized because it is obvious that these Gentiles are believers in Jesus because they have the Holy Spirit. And then the last example is right here in Acts chapter 19, where the, these disciples of John receive these gifts as a result of the laying on of Paul's hands, who is an apostle of Jesus. And so we see here how the church is expanding outwardly. It begins first in chapter 2 with Jews, then it moves on to Samaritans, and then Gentiles, and now disciples of John the Baptist. Because the gospel and the gifts of the Spirit are for everyone. They are for all people groups. The Spirit of God unites all Christians together, whether they are Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, or followers of John. Because the church is composed of all Christians, 
people groups, people from every walk of life. And all of God's people need the power of the Holy Spirit. We can do nothing in the Christian life apart from the power of God's Holy Spirit, who is given to all Christians. It is impossible to live the Christian life apart from the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. We need the Spirit's power to say no to sin and temptation. We need the power of the Spirit to give us gifts for ministry and evangelism. We need the Spirit's power to endure and to be faithful to Jesus Christ. And these disciples of John, who a little while earlier had not even heard about the Holy Spirit, are now filled with the Holy Spirit and are given many gifts by him. And so we too should desire that the Holy Spirit would empower us and fill us and point us to Jesus Christ, that we would be effective disciples of him. And then it goes on in verses 8 through 10, and it talks about Paul's ministry in Ephesus. And as always, Paul would go into the Jewish synagogues, the very city that he visited, and he would preach about Jesus the Messiah there. He would tell the Jews that their Messiah has come and why Jesus is the Messiah. He would preach the Old Testament and show them how Jesus Christ fulfills prophecy. And as normal, Paul, re Paul experiences some success at first, but then he is later rejected by the Jewish leaders in the synagogue. And he is kicked out of the synagogue, but Paul does not give up. He instead goes to the hall of Tyrannus, and he begins preaching there instead to both Jews and Gentiles. These Jewish leaders sadly reject the truth, and the rejection of the truth leads to a hardening of heart. The more a person rejects the truth, the harder and harder their, their heart becomes. And it says here that they speak evil about the way. And the term the way is how Christians described themselves. They describe themselves as followers of the way. And I think they call themselves this because this is what Jesus said about himself. He said in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ is the way of eternal life. He is the road that leads to heaven. And I'm reminded uh, by, by John Bunyan's book, Pilgrim's Progress, that all of us as Christians are traveling on the road that leads to life. We are traveling on the way that leads to the celestial city. That is who we are as believers in Jesus. We are those who travel the way and believe in Jesus who is the way to eternal life. But these Jewish leaders who rejected Paul have rejected the way of salvation. There is salvation in no one else. We must believe in Jesus to be saved. And so Paul does not give up, but he instead moves his preaching to another place, this hall of Tyrannus. The name Tyrannus literally means tyrant. And this was either the owner of the lecture hall or Tyrannus was a nickname given to a teacher or a philosopher who lectured there. Perhaps his students gave him this name as a, as a nickname, calling him a tyrant because of how difficult of a teacher he was. And in my life, I'm very thankful for difficult teachers because difficult teachers help us learn. They push us and encourage us to learn. They push us to our limit so that we will actually learn. And so I'm very thankful for difficult teachers in my life. And we see here that the Apostle Paul had a very strong work ethic. Paul would have worked as a tent maker in the cool of the morning. And then in the heat of the afternoon, he would move to the Hall of Tyrannus, where he would lecture on Christianity to all who would come. And Paul would have not charged them any money at all. His lectures would be free. Paul never charged people money to hear him preach or teach about Jesus because he supported himself as a tent maker. And he would hear preach to both Jews and Gentiles because God's kingdom is for all types of people. He would preach without fear of man because he knew the truth of what he preached and he was willing to suffer for it. And during this time in Paul's life, it was during this period in Ephesus that he wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians to the church back in Corinth because they had written to him asking about some questions that they needed answering. And they had many problems that had to be addressed in the life of their church. 
So the Apostle Paul kept himself busy by tent making, by preaching, and by writing letters to the many churches that he helped to plant. And like the Apostle Paul, we are called to make disciples of all people groups because everyone needs Jesus. Everyone is a sinner, and everyone needs the forgiveness that only he can give. And God wants to use you and me to be his disciples, to be his witnesses, wherever he sends us, to preach good news to people in our city who are lost and dying and on their way to hell. We need to tell them about how they can be saved and how they can come to know the real and the true Jesus. But like John Wesley long ago, we need to make sure that we first know the Lord, that we ourselves are saved before we preach the salvation to others. And my prayer is, is that all of us would experience what Wesley experienced, that we would feel our hearts strangely warmed by the love of God, and that we would share that love with others. And so let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the gospel and for the high calling and the commission that we have as believers in Jesus to share this good news with others as the Apostle Paul did long ago. Lord, may you make all of us village missionaries who have been sent out into this village of Amargosa Valley to be your missionaries, to be faithful where you have planted us. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. And our benediction for today is from Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you are dismissed in his peace.